It's from um, Gary de la Pomre, um, and he's going to give his multidisciplinary approach to earthquake prediction studies. Thank you. Ooh, there we go. Coming up. Yes, I'll cope. Uh, Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here again. Now, this is a slightly more controversial subject. In the past, I've been actually verbally abused at previous conferences for even discussing the opportunity that this might even exist. However, um, let me just try and... I just need to kick up a few notes here. And we're going to be talking about pre-earthquake processes, by understanding this, we will eventually have the ability to have reliable, to a degree, um, forecast prediction of earthquakes in advance of days. I liken one thing, um, it's quite interesting because this, if you think about winding up a rubber band very, very tightly, and you'll notice a couple of things that's actually happening, a couple of anomalies. One is the heat generated, and two is giving off an odor. And just bear that in mind, and that starts to show a little bit of the uh, uh, research which they're doing here now with the geophys side. So, make sure I book that. Huh? Okay, this is not about one anomaly. And I'm not going to explain in absolute detail about these, but earthquakes progress as a chain of reactions. And to keep it very simple, again, if you're wanting to describe the process to your family at home, if you stand on a stool and you're wanting, and you're, you think about that as Mother Earth balancing, her tectonic plates are balancing. Every now and again we have an earthquake and that's when the whole balance falls and you actually hit the ground, falling off your stool, keeping this very simple. However, there is a period between losing one's balance and the landing on the floor. And it's during that process where there is no return, so we can't, we can't the, the actual event will happen, there's no point of return. It does depend on how hard you hit the floor, okay, or how many hands or digits or whatever you put out will create the intensity, the scale, and also how fast you're falling or how slowly you're falling, and that creates the timelines. So what we're actually looking at here is a series of anomalies which are being observed, both from the ground and from satellite. Seismologists really don't like the aspect of this observations of anomalies from satellite. We're winning a few over during the, during the years, and we've been working at this, well, I've been working with the team from the social science aspect for about uh, 10 years, but these, these guys were ex-NASA scientists, and we're talking about people now joining the team from Russia, China, and Japan, Bulgaria, Italy. So, so what we're actually then observing is a signature closer to the event. So if we actually look at this, this area here, if I can get my toy out. So this area here, this line here, is the actual earthquake. But prior to that, these are various anomalies, which I'll show you in a moment. And as, as we get closer to a potential event, these anomalies merge, they strengthen, and start to give us a proper signature. Now, sometimes this can dissipate as well. Right? So, 
other events and other areas of tectonic plate may dissipate this. So it can become strong and it could dissipate. However, these anomalies exist. And for the majority of time, these anomalies actually result in an actual event. So looking at the actual uh, tectonic plate itself, the physical mode of geogases are released. Now, what we're actually saying here is that during the normal time, gases are being released on a continuous basis from micro fissures. So where you would actually think that the event and the anomaly would be the increase of gases, in fact, it's not. It's actually often, it's the reverse. Those micro fissures start to close up with the growing tension in the main fault line. So it's a, we're watching the changes of the anomalies, changes of the natural Earth's processes. Okay. So we're just showing here, these are the natural processes, okay? Now, if we start looking at some of the radon variations before an earthquake, okay? These, this is research, again, over 15 years. This is not something come out of uh, some recent research. This is proper research. We actually, they've now produced a variety of papers, and now in one book form as well. We'll have two books, in fact which I'll discuss in a moment. So here we're looking at the thermal anomalies, and then we're looking at typical seismospheric anomalies. Right? So there's a lot going into this, and at this present time, we're looking, I suppose, about six or seven different sets of anomalies, and as scientists who are investigating other areas of the ionosphere, the geophys, and where they are identifying anomalies, those are becoming part of the team as well. So it's not just one office block, one laboratory who's accumulating it all. When one, uh, when the coordinator of the team, Dmitry Rosanov, when he starts to identify one of, one of the key anomalies, he coordinates with the rest of the world. What are you seeing in this particular location? and they start to build a picture to it. So here again, a variety of ways of presenting the same facts, all right? And these observations are for the atmospheric signals, um, images showing radon anomalies, that was before COBE. Uh, middle area is showing thermal maps of, for Gujarat, India in 2001. Um, all derivatives from satellite thermal imaging. So, in the satellite arena, as we m are all pretty well aware nowadays, there are hundreds, hundreds of different types of satellite at varying levels observing the Earth for different p reasons. Now, some of these satellite, uh, satellites were not purposely put up there for our benefit, but in fact are observing anomalies which we are now able and capable of using and I I identify as uh, precursors or indeed um, uh, uh, strengthening our signature for uh, a, a potential earthquake event. So thermal emitted um, Earth's radiation registered by satellite observations, and since the 80s, thermally emitted Earth's radiation has been suggested by several physical models. So it's actually identifying what we've been observing before, but not necessarily understanding how we apply it, or indeed use it for other areas of investigation, and as I say, capable now of building this signature with other members of the team.
So seismo ionospheric precursor observed by the GPS tech. Uh, we show the technique of observing the electron density in the ionosphere with ground GPS receivers. Baseline GPS satellite constellation consists of 24 satellites positioned in six Earth-centered orbital planes. There are 508 ground GPS stations building the backbone of the global IGS network. So there's a lot of people doing other things in other areas providing the basic of the information, we are then actually able to take that information um, and understand the, the reasoning behind those anomalies, those changes, especially within the tectonic plate uh, 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 regions where, the, where, the, where, we, where we have the fault lines. And this just gives a, an overall map of the numerous areas of which we are observing at any one particular time. Now, the whole world is not covered as of yet, all right? Make that very clear. But we do have specific areas. And one of the specific areas we, we, we are monitoring is, is Nepal, for argument's sake. And interestingly, prior to the Nepal earthquakes, we actually saw a signature for the first one uh, 30 days in advance building and when when that first Gorka earthquake happened we continue to see a second signature which didn't dissipate a second separate signature that doesn't dissipate and the importance of that was that I with my rescue team friends and UN friends who had been um, already uh, reacting and, and and in country was able to say look there's a possibility of a second event the seismologists didn't like this they, they, can't, they couldn't get their minds around the, the, this opportunity. So my timeline of emails, when I emailed ahead and said, look, lads, just be careful. And eventually, when this event did happen, um, on the 12th of May, uh, we were actually, quite unusually, within 50 k kilometers of the epicenter. So and it was delayed by about four days from what we originally thought, and that was due to two events in Papua New Guinea. You think that's a long way away? We're just beginning to understand the anomalies between the plates, and something can happen a considerable distance away and have an effect on something a thousand miles or two, three thousand miles uh, east or west. We're beginning to understand that. What's my reason for saying this? I want you to open your minds these are real scientists working on this. So, a little bit more about the observations, sensor web, uh, concept of multi-parameter analysis. So observation, integration, synthesis, and then leading on to the prediction. And this was the, these were the signatures that actually come up on our map for the two events in Nepal. Now, we had the same for Citroën earthquake and many, many others, significant earthquakes, six and sevens, where we have been monitoring. All right? We're not always monitoring. This is, the team are always doing their research, they're doing other activities, they've got other commitments, but it's all to do with forwarding this whole science um, uh, and, and progressing it to where it becomes more and more reliable. Okay, so those are the actual signatures. Two books been presenting the various papers um, available through Wiley, um, and uh, uh, you can get copies of these. We just sorry, com Gary. Yeah, I We're understand that. <laughs> we simply we simply complete when anybody wants this whole presentation, then we give the reasonings behind this presentation to start, which which we were asked to to present or asked to submit in the very beginning. Um, you're very welcome to come and have a look at this one if you wish. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Please keep your minds open.